Good morning. We begin our time together this morning in song with the, one of my favorites by Jason Shelton, Morning Has Come. Jason was inspired to write this song from the view of the sunrise from the top of the Mountain Retreat and Learning Center in Highlands, North Carolina. So if you can imagine being on the top of a mountain and watching the sunrise as we call in this new day together, you can all, the words will be projected, we can all follow along and please make sure you're muted so that uh, we can all hear the music and, uh, and you can sing as energetically as you like. Here we go. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Gwinnett. My name is Jan Taddeo. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. It is my great joy and a distinct privilege to serve our faith as the minister of this congregation. I'm so glad you could all be with us this morning. Wherever you are, I hope it's as beautiful a day as it is right here in, in Lawrenceville, Georgia. We arrive from many places and many life experiences as we gather to recall our true selves, reflect on the meaning of our lives, and to explore questions of ultimacy together. If you are here for the first time or the thousandth time, you are welcome here. If you believe in many gods, a god or goddess, no god, or you're still figuring it out, you are welcome here. If you are gay, straight, bisexual, asexual, pansexual, transgender, cisgender, or still working on what your full expression of your identity is, you are welcome here. If you're covered in tattoos or are a blank canvas, you are welcome here. If you shout amen after each song or sentence, or if you prefer to sit with us quietly, you are welcome here. If you come here sober or addicted or anywhere on your healing journey, you are welcome here. If you are grieving or if you are celebrating, you are welcome here. Your whole self, all that you were, all that you are, all that you yearn to be is welcome here and you are just where you should be in a room full of compassionate, thoughtful, Unitarian Universalist ready to meet you where you are. You are home. If this is a first time with us this morning or a relative newcomer to our congregation, we welcome you and we hope that you will indeed find your spiritual home here with us. We are becoming a radically welcoming sanctuary in a green space. We foster spiritual growth as we joyfully nurture connections and community within our walls and beyond. If this is your first time here, I encourage you to join us several times virtually and then again in person when we are able to gather safely again. 
to experience the full flavor of this congregation and this faith tradition. Come be curious, courageous, and compassionate with us. <clears throat> now I invite you to take a very deep breath and let it out slowly. And again, bring every molecule of your being into this precious time we have set aside to be together this morning. As sound vibrates through us and around us, may we be reminded how deeply, profoundly, inextricably interconnected we are with one another, with all beings, with this earth, and with every star in the cosmos. <laughs> The author of these opening words is anonymous, unknown, but no less powerful. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community and to each other. To honor the lighting of our chalice, I offer these words from Albert Schweitzer. At times our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. And now it's time for our wonder box. <clears throat> I wish there was a way to virtually have somebody open the wonder box. I'm going to work on that. If you have ideas, let me know. But here we go. Wow. There's not much in here. But there is this one thing. If any of you have done a marathon, you might know this or done some kind of road race. This was my first and only marathon, <laughs> the Great Bermuda Walking Marathon. I did this in 2002. I had to raise a lot of money and uh, it was for the cause of diabetes, a cure for diabetes. <clears throat> And I went all the way to Bermuda to walk this long walk, and it was 13 and a <clears throat> 13 miles around twice around the island we were on. I went there all by myself. I was really nervous about going there all by myself. And I had to pray a lot on that because I didn't have a team to cheer me on. I didn't have relatives there to look after me. And, uh, but I knew I was not alone. And I even had um, a support person. They, they, you could recruit a support person there at the, at the event. And I had made a sign that said, you are not alone, for them to hold up when I came around the loop. And I knew I wasn't alone because all those people who had contributed to my going there, to the cause that I was supporting, uh, were with me and my family was with me and everybody was with me in spirit and I knew that so I knew I wasn't alone and it was probably one of the hardest things I've done and uh, I was the last one in after nine and a half hours and that's not really the story for today but uh, it was a good experience I'm glad I did it the blisters eventually healed this is the story I want to tell you this morning it's called tiny the god written by Becky Brooks, who's a religious educator up in Baltimore, Maryland. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a tiny little, itty bitty, very small, tiny little god named Tiny. She lived her life hearing stories of all the big gods and, well, let's face it, 
she was jealous. She knew she needed to think of some kind of special spark of an idea that would make her existence meaningful. After watching humans for a long time, she hit upon something that just might work, something to make people think, yeah, that tiny has really got a good idea going. This was it. This was going to make her famous. Ready? Here it is. You are not alone. She took the form of a very light breeze and in a voice so quiet, each person heard it only in their mind. She said, you are not alone. You are not alone. People loved it. It was perfect because who doesn't want to hear that? <clears throat> Pretty soon, Tiny was comforting people all over with these words. You are not alone. Every evening, she took the form of the breeze and whispered it in people's minds. Until one day, she encountered someone who wasn't comforted at all. When Miriam heard Tiny's words in her mind, instead of feeling comforted, she felt agitated. Something was just kind of off about it. She kept saying it to herself over and over again. You are not alone. You are not alone. She tossed and turned. She couldn't sleep. In the morning, she went to read the paper, and instead of skimming everything, she found herself drinking in every single story. She was only halfway through when she found herself crying. I am not alone, she said. I am connected to every one of these people. They live in my town and my country and my world. They love their children like I love mine. They're scared sometimes, and so am I. They hurt like I hurt. I am not alone. I can help. Tiny was surprised. It hadn't occurred to her that someone might think of it that way. Tiny kept watch over Miriam to monitor this interesting development. Miriam and a coworker met online in a meeting and talked about a law they hoped the Senate would pass. And Tiny noticed when Miriam wrote a letter to her senator about it right away. She noticed that when Miriam turned in her grocery order, she bought a few extra things for her neighbor and left them with a colorful note on their porch. She noticed that Miriam had tears in her eyes when she joined in her congregation's worship on her computer, and she heard her favorite hymn through the small speakers. Miriam got out her phone and made an extra donation to her congregation. She watched as Miriam wrote postcards to friends and family near and far, waved to the dog walkers who passed by her house, and strung up colorful lights in her living room window. But most importantly to Tiny, she noticed when Miriam received a phone call one evening from a friend she hadn't heard from in a long while. His voice was shaking. I'm having a hard time, he said. He started to tell her about his troubles, but he began to cry. Miriam got herself comfortable in her favorite chair. Take your time. I'll stay on the line with you. You are not alone. I am here. I am here. Tiny heard those words like an echo in her mind. You are not alone. I am here. You are not alone. I am here. Say that to somebody near you. You are not alone. I am here. And even if you're home alone, say, you are not home. You are not alone. I am here. In that moment, Tiny knew that she was nothing without Miriam's hands and heart and spirit. And she knew that what she wanted what the world needed more than anything was what Miriam had learned to give. So Tiny went to work. Instead of just spending her evenings spreading the gospel of you are not alone, she spent her night times doing it too and her mornings and afternoons. Pretty, pretty soon she was spending every moment doing it until she became the breeze itself. And that is why there are no paintings of Tiny, no busts or holy books just a breeze, a low voice, and many, many helping hands, loving hearts, and caring spirits. You can hear the echo if you listen closely. You are not alone. I am here. When water bottles are left in the desert for those who risk their lives to cross it, you are not alone. I am here. At the bedside of a dying man, 
You are not alone. I am here. In the jailhouse and the sanctuary, you are not alone. I am here. Separate and together, you are not alone. I am here. May it be so. Let us sing together, Find a Stillness by Carl Seberg, so we can listen for that breeze. Well, as happens, this service has evolved quite a bit since I wrote the description at the end of May. A lot has happened in the world. Tiny's message, you are not alone, is needed now more than ever. It reminds us we are indeed inextricably interconnected. There's a song by Peter Mayer called The String. Peter Mayer is a Unitarian Universalist singer-songwriter in Minnesota. And The String is such a poignant song. He describes the spiritual string that is or the, the invisible string that connects all of our hearts all around the globe, that we are all connected. And when someone is suffering and they're tugging on the string, we can all feel it. And I'm just going to cry today, so just, I'm okay. <laughs> but when someone tugs on that, screen, that string, we know there are people hurting and suffering. And it's a call, a call to action of some sort. There's also a place in the song where he says that when you hear someone playing the string, that there's joy. I don't know if he says quite joy, but that, that all is well with someone when they're just playing music on the string. There's a lot tugging on the string right now. I'm going to name some places. Santee, California, Savannah and Atlanta, Georgia, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Little Rock, Arkansas, Houston, Texas, Boston, Massachusetts, Washington, D.C., Portland, Oregon, New York, New York, Belgium, London, Berlin, Australia, Detroit, Michigan, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and so many more places where that string is being tugged, where you have people facing off between peaceful protesters to say black lives do matter and we need to make sure they matter and we need to fight to make everyone make them matter and people who don't like that message and are re responding often with aggression and violence. And the people stuck in the middle of this, our National Guard and our police officers, some who are taking a knee with the protesters, and um, it's just a crazy time right now. Many of us know people in these places. Um, I have a good friend in Santee, which is just a tiny uh, little city on the edge of San Diego City, and um, 
and it's it's becoming the the hot point for incredible confrontation today at two o'clock California time. They're expecting people from at least all over California, probably from much farther places around the country to converge there, many with violent intentions. And my friend, when I talked to her yesterday afternoon was, she and her husband were debating whether to um, evacuate and go to be in another state where their son lives I don't know what she decided yet. So please hold Santee in your hearts and prayers in all of these places around our globe. It's so amazing that people in Belgium and England and Australia and Germany and so many other places are, are holding this with us. They want us to do better. I also want us to hold and lift up Gianna Floyd, the daughter of George Floyd, and some of his other family. I couldn't find all of their names. It's a large family, but his brother, Philonese, his aunt, Angela, his girlfriend, Courtney, his nephew, Brandon, all who are grieving and also who know they are not alone. Imagine the whole world is thinking of them holding them, helping them. And I was pleased to learn that the National Guard has been called out to Santee and to some other cities as well to protect the protesters. There was concern they were being deployed to put down the protests, but in fact they're being called to support these protests. That's a very powerful, powerful shift. And call me crazy, but I want to ask you to also hold in your prayers and to send healing energy to the people who perpetuate this harm. The people in this particular instant, Derek Chauvin, Alexander Kung, Thomas Lane, and Tao Tai, Tao, sorry, Tan Tao. The police officers who were involved in George Floyd's death I can't imagine they planned to do that. I don't know why they didn't stop, but I do know something about what happens when the adrenaline is running and people are caught up in something and it's hard to stop. And that's what creates this violence at our protests and all of this when the energy gets to a place that we can't stop even if we think we should, if we even have the space for that thought that I should stop. <laughs> Call me crazy, but I hold in my prayers every day the leaders of this country, people with whom I have a lot of disagreements about how they are doing things. I hold them up. I think about the day they were born. I think about that newborn baby emerging into the world fresh and full of possibility. And I, my heart breaks to think what took place in their lives that had them grow up to be people to cause such harm. My heart breaks for all of those who were raised in this country, which is everyone, steeped in racism and steeped in, in bias and prejudice and and now, and my heart breaks for all who are victims of that racism, for all of the black Americans who are <sighs> treated so badly every day and generationally harmed through our history of slavery. And I said a lot about that last week, so I won't go much further with that. I want to talk about compassion, because that's what this is about. It's being able to find compassion for ourselves, for our beloveds, for the people beyond. And how do we do that? <clears throat> compassion is walking with. Compassion is knowing that we are all human, that we all experience suffering. This was the Buddha's, I put Buddha here today, remind us that his journey was a journey of, of compassion. That when he discovered the suffering in the world, he said, 
this has to stop. We have to be, we have to do something. <laughs> but we also can do something sometimes just spiritually. We can do things with our hands and our hearts. So the first place is compassion for yourself. <sighs> How many times a day do you beat yourself up, call yourself a bad name, say, oh, that was stupid, or I'm stupid, or whatever. You know that we're all imperfect and we're meant to be imperfect, which actually means that we're all absolutely perfect, just the way we are. Can we keep growing and be better at many things? Sure, but we're all on this path. We weren't created to be some possible form of perfect that I don't even understand anymore. We were created to learn, to grow, to take care of one another. So look here first at yourself and be kind and gentle and be friendly with yourself. To love yourself so you can love your neighbor. Avoid aggression to yourself. Show yourself good works. And then reach out to your beloveds, the people you know, the people you love, the people you're acquainted with, the people you have good feelings for, and send them loving kindness. Be gentle with them. Be friendly with them. Send them a postcard. <laughs> Call them up. Be in touch. And then we are asked to look at the people with whom we have issues, the people that are hard for us to be in relationship with, or the people we have no relationship with. They're just people we know about in the world, like our elected leaders, that we worry about the decisions they're making and the ways in which they are increasing the divide in our country rather than working to bring us more together. Send it out to those people who are difficult for you to love. Send them loving kindness. And then imagine all the beings <clears throat> on this planet, all of the trees and the flowers and the bushes and the grasses and the fields of food and all of the waters on this earth and all of the creatures in the waters and all of the creatures in the air and all of the creatures that crawl and dance upon this earth and send them, send all of creation your loving kindness. I don't know that we can change the big things at this point. I was talking with my mentor yesterday and she said back in the 60s, the 1960s, when Martin Luther King was giving his speech about the mountaintop and the dream, we knew what needed to be done then. We knew what we needed to do about climate change. We knew what we needed to do about racism. We knew what we needed to do about poverty. And we didn't do it. We didn't do it. And these 60 years later, it may be too late for a lot of that but not for everything. We do what we can with what we have, where we are. And this congregation is doing things with what we have, where we are. We are involved in the Gwinnett Interfaith Alliance, which formed after the deadly shootings in, at the synagogue in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago. We are working with Gwinnett County. The Gwinnett Interfaith Alliance is working with Gwinnett County to start civic dinners in our county, which is a, a formal process of gathering people together to have big conversations together. It is an opportunity for us to um, engage with people we don't know. And maybe the first step is simple conversations, seemingly easy conversations about what do we want with our parks? What do we want to do with our parks? How do we use our parks? What do we imagine and envision for our parks? That's kind of the line we're going on now in conversations with the park system. We are, thanks to the absolute doggedness and, de and determination of our congregant, Steve Babb, we now have a Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition that is working on the Gwinnett Remembrance Project to gather soil from the places in Gwinnett County where people were lynched, to put markers there and to build a monument in our county to honor these people who died at the hands of this racist culture we built. But the monuments and the markers and the soil is just, those are not the real work. The real work is the conversations, the truth and reconciliation, the getting community conversations going so that we can 
dig deep into our history and own it and atone for it and move hearts towards being better together. And now we're supporting the Lawrenceville Cooperative Ministries. We're gathering food tomorrow. We're going out and protesting in various parts of Georgia. We are bearing witness. We are making masks. And now the mask collection is for the protesters. That's from the uh, organization from the that was collecting them for hospitals has asked now for more for the protesters. So the big question for us as a congregation over the next few months is what is the work that needs us to do it? My mentor told me to ask that question of myself and I invite you to ask that question of yourself. What is the work that needs you to do it? And maybe right now your work is taking care of your family, being with friends, taking care of friends. Maybe your work is protesting. Maybe your work is just getting through today with whatever challenges you're facing and then getting through tomorrow. But what is the work that needs you to do it? How will you serve the world? And it doesn't have to be the world. It could be your neighbor. Think local. And what is the work for us, for our congregation to do? Maybe we're already doing it. Maybe we are doing exactly what we need to do. Right now, today, our work is to extend loving kindness. Loving kindness to ourselves, to our beloveds, to those with whom we have troubled relationships or people with whom we have very harsh judgment about them, to send them loving kindness, to all whom we don't know and to all our relations and to all beings in this world, we send loving kindness. May it be so. And let us sing together in, our, in order to facilitate that process. We sing together, filled with loving kindness. <clears throat>
I invite all of us to just become aware of our bodies and to feel the connection to the ground, to the space all around us and over us. Let's become aware of our breathing and feeling the air go in through our nose, down our nasal and throat, filling out our belly, and then returning out again. Now let's just allow this breath to kind of breathe us. And we may focus on it at times and other times it'll just take care of ourselves. It'll just take care of itself as we take care of ourselves. As we bring our attention to an experience or experiences that we have had of either being compassion or feeling compassion directed towards us. And it could be a big thing or it could have been a small thing. It could be somebody we know, it could be a pet, uh, it could be even a place we love that we have compassion for. And as we do this, where do we feel this in our bodies? Where do we feel our compassion in our bodies? And what does it feel like? We feel it in our chest or our heads or our bellies or our pelvises or maybe somewhere else. Let's just feel it and appreciate it. Now, this is our well and ocean or our, our place that we go to find this feeling of compassion and let's recycle some of it back to ourselves so that when we breathe in we can breathe in any pain or distress or discomfort from anywhere in our body and let it go to this place in our bodies we've connected with compassion and let it remain for a moment or two and then as we exhale we're going to breathe out healing and a feeling of embracing and comforting to this part of ourselves. Now this also includes any spiritual or emotional pain. We also draw from our chalice of compassion and give empathy to our wounded and sorrowful parts and feelings to our inner children into our to our inner children and to our wounded warriors. And any time that we need to go back to when we have experienced compassion before or given it before, let's do that. So I'm just taking in our time, circling compassion through our own bodies, through our emotions, our spirits. feeling it. You don't necessarily have to change anything other than just feeling this this loving kindness and embracing of ourselves. And then we can breathe in the suffering of our loved ones, whether they're people or pets, whether they're the creatures that surround us wherever we are, or forests, or rivers, or streams, anywhere that we are. Just breathing from our well of compassion, bringing in pain and sorrow, suffering, breathing out this empathy, regard, and caring. And if we're able, let us also breathe in the suffering of those that are impacted by oppression, by prejudice, by poverty, by hunger, by not being able to breathe literally or figuratively, by illness, by discouragement or depression by fear, or by terror, or by feeling hateful. 
Let us take it all into our sacred space of compassion and breathe out hope, relief, encouragement, and right action. And going back to the initial well that we've created, feeling compassionate feelings inside us and in our body, our core, the center of the circle of love, filled with loving kindness for our planet and all feeling beings, feeling in our bodies and letting expand throughout our entire body as we begin either to stretch or shake, wiggle, whatever we need to reconnect to our mundane world with desire to practice compassion, receiving and giving. Let us respond with From You I Receive by Joseph and Nathan Siegel. We'll sing it through twice. <laughs> Daniel, thank you for that lovely compassion practice. It was very helpful. Maybe I won't cry through the rest of the service. <laughs> Our congregation is committed to creating a more compassionate world. To this end, each quarter we split our plate collection with an organization selected by our Giveaway the Plate Committee. Our second quarter plate recipient is Rainbow Village, located in Duluth. Rainbow Village transforms the lives of homeless families with children by providing a stable community and services that instill initiative, self-development, and accountability for future generations. They offer self-sufficiency skills, adult life skills, child and youth programs, mental health services, early childhood development, and they have an alumni program. Our plate contributions also support the mission and vision of this congregation. So I ask that you please give generously to support the work of this very important ministry in our wider community, as well as the shared ministry of our congregation. As we listen to a recording of our pianist Brian Bishop playing the Minuet in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach, you will see on the screen ways to contribute to our offering via PayPal, Venmo, or by mailing a check payable to UUCG to the address shown. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, please know that your presence with us today is a great gift to this congregation, and you may choose to let the plate pass if you like. The offering will now be gratefully received. May the generous gifts received today move us towards creating a more 
connected and compassionate world. And my gratitude to Russ Taddeo for running sound and video this morning and to Christiana McQueen for managing our Zoom room. So glad uh, that we have these dedicated people to make this happen. <laughs> and now is our time for the call to connection. It's important, really important that we stay connected. So I hope that you are taking advantage of these many opportunities to do so. If you are a first time guest with us or relatively new and you haven't done so yet, please text the word welcoming to the number on the screen, 678-931-8228. You will receive a few texts and emails about how to connect with others and learn more about our congregation. It's for a set period of time, just a few weeks, and we won't inundate you with them, but it will help you to know more about us and to help you get connected. So please, if you're new, text welcoming to that number. Also, if you are new to Unitarian Universalism or new to this congregation, we have a UU 101 visitor orientation uh, once a month, and that is an opportunity to learn more about the UU Congregation of Gwinnett as well as our larger faith. And uh, on also in once a month, we offer our Path to Membership program, UU 102. So if you've been to 101 and you're interested in learning what it means to be a member, what is the commitment of being a member, then uh, come and join me for the 102 program. Both will be offered on June 21st at 1230. And you can sign up for those on our website. It is helpful if you register in advance. You can get the links off our website, but it's helpful if we know that you're coming so that we can plan for how many people will be joining us in those programs. Today, starting uh, in about 12, 13 minutes, is the Justice for Black Lives uh, rally at um, which is being held, uh, it's first of all, it's at Satellite Boulevard in Pleasant Hill. It, it's supposed to go until two, but the way these things go, it'll probably be going longer. It's sponsored by the Georgia NAACP, the Alliance for Black Lives, Jewish Community Relations Council, and the Georgia Alliance for Social Justice, Indigenous Peoples Movement, and the Global Purpose Approach. So it's a well-sponsored event and um, bring your masks, bring water, and maintain social distance. We'll have signs at the church you can pick up if you like. Uh, we'll be gathering there, uh, some of us to do a walkthrough today, and we'll be there before one o'clock if you want to drive by and pick up a sign. Also, I encourage you to support the Lawrenceville Cooperative Ministry. We are collecting uh, non-perishable items tomorrow from one o'clock to four o'clock. If you can't make it during that time, you could leave them in a uh, waterproof container, because I don't know what the weather's gonna be like, uh, out under the porch, uh, out front of the church. But, um, you know, hopefully you can drop them off between one and four tomorrow. They especially have asked for rice and jelly and oatmeal and beans. And I don't know if I want that recipe or not, but anyway, sounds interesting. Please support them. And any other non-perishable items would be welcome. You can also, um, if those of you who are making masks, keep doing it. Um, as I said in the homily, uh, the organization that's been collecting them for hospitals is now also going to be offering them to protesters in the area. So uh, it's one way you can support the protest if you are not able to actually go there. Um, personally, I am continuing to limit my physical engagement with anyone uh, because I need to be strong and healthy for all of you for the long run here. So um, I won't be at the protest, but I will be there in spirit. Another way to help out is the um, GwinnettCares.org. Uh, go to that website. There's ways to donate, ways to volunteer, and ways to get support. So I invite you to check that out. Uh, if for getting connected, lots of ways to get connected. I have set up a weekly space for a congregational check-in on Wednesdays from noon to one. Bring your lunch or your breakfast, like me, <laughs> if you like, um, and uh, come and have a chat with all of us who show up in that space from noon to one on Wednesdays. And then uh, every Thursday from six to eight, we have our virtual happy hour that Bill Binshoff and Mary Jane Stout are co-hosting that space. So I'm grateful to both of them for managing that space and holding it for you. Please come and join them. And check our e-news and our uh, website calendar for more ways to connect virtually. Uh, join our choir virtually. Uh, we're doing a lot of talking, but we're also working on some virtual choir options. and. 
our book club, Covenant of UU Pagans, Family Game Night, Yarns from the Heart, so much more going on. Please find a way to connect. We have resources for families. We have virtual intention table activities. There are links in our weekly e-news. If you're not getting the weekly e-news, please look on our website under uh, newsletters and under news and, and find a way to do that. Um, it's an email to info at uucg.org and let them know you want to get the e-news. Uh, also, we'll be offering weekly resources for family faith development, so watch for those. Uh, da, 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 da. Sunday faith development. Next Sunday, we're doing a, a small group conversation on our monthly theme, which is compassion. So come and join with a small group to explore what it means to be compassionate. What does compassion mean to you? What, how do we practice compassion? Uh, our auction. So we have uh, been doing a lot of selling stuff for our auction online here after the services. And uh, so we need to continue to receive your contributions. Uh, you can get really creative. There are ways to use Zoom and we can offer you a Zoom room if you need one for a dinner, a brunch, an excursion, services, game nights, movie nights, lessons, things like that. So, um, you know, think of some things you might offer that way or actual objects like gift certificates, vacation rentals, fine art, unique collectibles, activity baskets, theme baskets, show tickets for something happening in 2021 something like that. Um, there's a, a link uh, on the screen there for how to donate items. It's a very detailed uh, donation form. Uh, so look for that. Send us stuff to sell. And next Sunday is your big opportunity to cool off for the summer in your very own 12 foot diameter, 30 inch deep backyard pool with a cover and a pump. And I'm sure that our auctioneer will do a very fabulous job of making that uh, especially exciting. But I will tell you this, that I've done some research to find out how much do these cost. Like, can I just go up to Walmart or Target and buy one? And you can't. They don't appear to be available anywhere, not even on Amazon. And I found prices ranging from 300 to 500 and I don't think they sell for that much when they're in stock. And so this might be the thousand dollar auction item. <laughs> anyway, think about how wonderful it might be for you to enjoy and you and your family to enjoy a nice cool dipping place over the summer uh, and prepare for your bidding next Sunday for that. Now let us rise in body or spirit to say together the words we say as we extinguish our chalice, followed by our closing song, number 1020, Lean on Me by Bill Withers. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I don't hear it yet.
Beloveds, please continue physical distancing and staying home as much as possible. We Unitarian Universalists believe in science and know that this virus is real and is likely to spike again, especially now that so many people are out and about and the added factor of the protests going on all over the area. And oh my, you are each so precious. Please take good care. Our service has ended and our service to one another and our vision begins and our conversations with one another begin.